give you a warning. I am not probably going to have sufficient time to deal a lot with um, today's topic is creation and providence. As I got into this, I'm not going to deal a lot with providence today. I'm going to address it. I'm going to define it for you, but I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. And, and the, the main reason I'm not going to do that is the biggest area of God's providence as a doctrine that people are concerned about, interested in, arguing against, has to do with the issue of election. That is predestination. It has to do with God's providence in uh, saving of souls. And that really is a topic that comes much more under uh, the second term of this class, where we will get into our doctrine of humanity and of salvation and sanctification and those issues. Mm -hmm. So I'll touch on it today in some really broad principles. Um, you've read the book, right? If anybody, I still have copies of this book available. If anybody does not have one, you know, um, truck's been driving back and forth, I think, all morning. Um, so uh, that's available to you, and he does a good job of doing a, a sort of, this is the Calvinist Reform view, this is the Arminian view, and he talks about it fairly generally in terms of God's providence, but the real issue there, the real <coughs> disagreement has to do with the who gets saved. And so that's something I'm, I choose to deal with when we get into more the doctrine of humanity and the doctrine of salvation kinds of stuff in the second term, but I'll just touch on on Providence today. So if you came, you know, just licking your lips, waiting your appetite for that discussion, we're not going to get into that in a lot of detail today because that would take too long. Okay. Um, today, of course, we're dealing with the doctrines of creation and providence, briefly providence. <coughs> Next week, we will talk about the doctrines of the supernatural. I didn't have a better category for that. I want to talk about miracles, prayer, angels, and demons. The things that are not of this natural world, but still are part of our belief and what, what are the doctrines related to those. And then week six, probably the most critical of all in terms of our Christian understanding, and that is the doctrine of Christ. Um, Christology is the theological word. There's theological words for all of this stuff. Um, Christology is the, is the study of the doctrine of uh, Christ, that is how Jesus was the Messiah and therefore our Savior. Um, I say that's probably the most important because that is the doctrine on which everything else in Christianity pivots. If you ever wonder whether or not somebody who knocks on your door and wants to talk to you about spiritual things, if you wonder whether they're really Christian, the answer to that question is, what do they say about Jesus? You know, what is their Christology? Because we can be wrong on a lot of other stuff. And I, I always say that there's going to be a whole lot of forehead stopping in heaven. You know, we're all going to be going, how did I miss that? Why didn't I get that? You know, what was wrong with me that I didn't see that? But the one part that we can't get wrong and still claim to be a Christian is what do we say about Jesus? What do we say about Christ? What is our Christology? And so that's the pivotal point. That's the critical one that we will deal with uh, in two weeks. And then week seven, in the first half, we will deal with pneumatology, okay, which is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And the second half will be the final exam. I am going to do everything in my power. I've been promising, and I will honestly do everything I can to have for you next week the document, everything you need to know in um, about Systematic Theology 1. I say everything in my power because right now everything's piling up. And um, that means I not only have to give you the stuff from the past four weeks and next week before I lecture on it, but I also have to try to give you the stuff from the following weeks in order for you to have a full picture. That's a lot. And so I'm going to do everything I can. I, please do not stone me or, or ridicule me or cast me out oh. if what I give you is, <laughs> is everything up till that and the following week you will ask me, I don't, yeah, I don't need this. <laughs> we can't ridicule. Uh, that's going to stop you. Brian. And then I'm supposed to cast my oh. shoe on you. Uh, no, don't, mm. don't throw your shoes out to you. Uh, <laughs> All right, doctrine of creation. Let's talk about the doctrine of creation. The first principle we want to talk about here, and remember, I am not lecturing directly from Grudem. I'm trying to give you some other directions on these issues so that you have a more comprehensive view. You can read the book, and I trust you are reading the book, but I want you to get um, different facets of this thing from other, different, uh, other systematic theologies. But the first issue we need to deal with in the doctrine of creation, and of course the doctrine of creation is um, our belief about how God created the universe first. And then we'll, we're going to deal with some specific pieces of the universe, especially humanity. Because the creation of humanity is the most critical aspect of this, since humanity is described in scripture as being the pinnacle of God's creation. All right? So first, 
God created from nothing. The, the Latin is ex nihilo, from nothing. Genesis 1, 1 and 2 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was, upon the surf, was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now I am not, right now, although Grudem gets into it a little bit, I am not going to discuss the gap theory that some people believe there was a gap between verse 1 and verse 2 and all of that stuff. The principle here, whatever, whatever people think about that, is in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He did so without using other material. Now, we are said to be in the image of God. There are a lot of ways, we'll talk about, that we are in the image of God. One of the ways that we're in the image of God is that we are creative. Human beings are the only creatures that paint, or do architecture, or sing. And, you know, birds sing, but they don't write music. It's whatever, whatever <coughs> built in. And so we are creative in the way God is creative, but there's a fundamental difference here. We are creative by taking other materials and rearranging it in a way that we find attractive. And that's, that includes <coughs> cooking. I remember there's a, a book that we read by Bob, not Bob Buford, what was the guy's name? Uh, called Heat, and it's a story of him wanting to work in a professional kitchen, and he went to work for Mario Batali, you know, one of the Iron Chefs, Mario Batali with the Crocs and the shorts and the whole thing. Well, Mario Batali comes into the restaurant one day, and he sees in the garbage can somebody has taken the, cut the tops off of a bunch of beets. Well, beet greens can be used in recipes. And he sees this, and Batali starts digging all this stuff out of, out of the trash can. And he goes, what's wrong with you people? You don't apparently understand what we do here. What we do is we buy food, and then we repackage it in a way that people are more attracted to, and then we charge them money for it. <laughs> yes. Well, that's a creative act. You take something that already exists, and you rearrange it or repackage it in a way that you find more attractive, and then you charge people money for it. Um, that's the way in which we're creative. We repackage. We reorganize materials. That is not how God is created. So we're, we are like God in that way somewhat. But God created from nothing. Everything that was, or nothing was, everything that was used in making the universe, God created. Prior to that act of creation, nothing was in existence except God himself. Not time, not space, not anything else. You know, you could sort of draw a full stop after, in the beginning, God. Because that's all there was in the very beginning. And from nothing else, at that point, God moves to create all that exists, including the matter. And Grudem gets into a lot of detail about evolutionary theory and all that, and I've, some of you have heard me say before that the biggest problem that secular evolutionists have, I'm not talking about you know, evolutionary theists or whatever, but you ask somebody who has no faith orientation toward creation, well, how how is the universe created? And they will say to you, well, at the very start there was this infinitely dense speck of matter. And that infinitely dense speck of matter exploded in what we call the Big Bang. And when it exploded, it began to expand outwards. And as it expanded outwards, the residue from that process left behind the material from which we get planets and asteroid belts and moons and suns and the whole thing. Well, if you ask them the question, where did the infinitely dense particle of matter come from? You will get a long pause. <laughs> and then they will say, well, see, there was this infinitely dense particle of matter because there is no answer for that. There's also no answer for what caused it to blow up and when it blew up, how did it blow up in such an exact way that it created the universe and especially a planet like ours that... that that you know, life could be on and all that sort of stuff. The odds against that, and um, I think it was Gruden that gets into, it's like 10 to the 360 millionth power is the odds of things happening in just the way they did. Okay, I'm not gonna get into that right now. But the idea is, the only answer for where did that, even if you believe the Big Bang happened, and I'm, I'm sort of on the fence here, where did that speck come from? It came from God. Nothing existed except God before he created the material from which the universe was made. Now, exactly the process that he used, we don't know. And as I will tell you later, anybody who says they know or anybody who says that you're stupid if you don't agree with them, that's pride talking. All right? We'll get to that.
God created from nothing. Now, the highest point of God's creation is humanity. Scripture is clear about that. Uh, humanity was created last as the peak and was actually made in the image of God. Again, the Latin verse, uh, version of this, which you will hear from time to time, is imago Dei. Imago Dei, in the image of God. Only human beings are made in the image of God. The first passage that refers to this, Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us, and you will notice the plural here. The Old Testament word for God, I mean, there's a proper name of God, Yahweh, which means I am that I am. We talked about that last week. But usually the word that is translated God in the Old Testament is Elohim. Elohim is a plural word. Doesn't mean there are multiple gods, because it's very clear there is one God. But the fact that Elohim is used for to refer to God, and it's a plural, and we have passages like this that said, let us make mankind in our image. God is not speaking to the angels. We are not made in the image of the angels. We are made in the image of God. But from the very start, there is a clear indication that there is some plurality going on. There is a community of God. That God is one God in three persons. The Trinity appears from the first chapter of Genesis on. Let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in communion, in, in interaction, in relationship with each other, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and, in the, and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now, this job that God gave to humanity when he created them, we're going to talk about that a little bit later too when we talk about uh, how we're supposed to understand what it means to be in the image of God. That's one of the characteristics. Okay. Um, a second verse that, that comes along in Genesis 5 when God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them, and he named them mankind when they were created. So the question that confronts us, if we are made in the image of God, and no other creature, no other part of creation anywhere is made in the image of God, what does it mean to be Imago Dei? What does it mean to be created in the image of God? Because that gives us not only a fundamental understanding about God's creation process, which is what we're talking about right now, but this will then lead us into our theology of, of humanity, what it means to be a human being in the second term, when we get into systematics too, right? A traditional way of looking at this is that there are three aspects of how we are made in the image of God, how we are made in Mago Dei. Uh, the first one of those, which I've referred to several times before, is that we are made in the image of God substantively. That's the word that's used. I didn't make that up. That means that we have similar characteristics to God's. And again, you were all here last week. If you haven't, I'm, no, I'm sure you've watched the videotape. We talked last week about the fact that there are some um, characteristics of God or attributes of God that are non-communicable. We are not, and which means we can't get that. We can't, we don't have those aspects, those attributes. Like omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence. I don't know everything. I am not all powerful. I can't be everywhere at once. Those are some of the incommunicable characteristics of God. But God has other characteristics that are called communicable attributes. Meaning, while our version of those attributes or characteristics is much smaller, much more limited, Still, we have an aspect of those attributes. For instance, God is perfect in wisdom. Well, we are not perfect in wisdom, but humanity has a degree of wisdom. You know, there are great thinkers and writers down through history that we learn from their wisdom. The book of Proverbs was inspired by God, written by traditionally Solomon. Um, the idea of power. We are not all powerful as God is, but we, do, we can exercise some degree of power. Creativity, I've already mentioned. Reason. God's reason is perfect. We have the ability to reason. We screw that up a lot, but still, we have that ability. The idea of self-awareness. 
that I am um, I'm conscious of myself as an individual, as a unique individual, in a way that n no other creature seems to have. Um, the fact that I am spiritual, that I have a spirit, you know, God is spirit, and we are to worship Him in spirit and truth. My spirit is not equal to God's, mine is a created spirit, but still I have a spirit. Um, I seek knowledge. Knowledge being one of the aspects of the perfection of God. And so those are ways in which we have a diminished or a lesser version of some of the attributes of God. And in that way, we are made in His image. All of those attributes that I just mentioned and others that we have, we have them as a reflection of God's greatness. We are in His image in those ways. Is that fair? You got that? Those are called a, sub a substantive understanding of the image of God. Secondly, we have a relational aspect in which we are made in the image of God. This means that we have an ability to establish and maintain complex and intricate relationships, both with God and with each other. Now, animals can have relationships. They have packs and things like that. But those relationships are always very simple. Okay? Um, they're, they don't have the complexity of structure... Uh, our dog would not recognize his aunt if he met her walking down the street, okay? Even though he probably met her at one point. We have an ability to be relational in a complex and intricate kind of way and with a degree of intimacy that other creatures, other than God, do not have. And so we are made in the image of God in the sense that we are relational in a, again, a reduced, a, a minor way as God is. You know, God is perfect in his relationships. In fact, as I said, the most perfect of relationships is the relationship that the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, have in and of themselves as part as the three persons of one God. There is a perfect relationship. When we say God is love, how could that happen if God, you know, did not have the ability to have love in and of himself? Love exists between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit apart from any other being. And that is the way in which God is love. The third way in which we are created Imago Dei in the image of God is a functional way. This is what I mentioned earlier, that the image of God is imprinted on us in a way that we have responsibilities for authority, for leadership, for ruling. Initially, rule over the animals of the earth. It's also why we develop complex political structures. There is inherent in us a sense in which we recognize responsibility and the fulfillment of that responsibility in an organized and systematic way, which is characteristic of God. It's not characteristic in the same way of any other creature. Yes, the strongest male gorilla rules, but in our culture, it could be the shortest and weakest that rules because they happen to have other abilities. And so there's a sense in which there's a very crass kind of power structure that exists in the animal world. But in terms of a functional recognition of a task for ruling over things and managing things, especially creation, that exists for humanity alone. That was the first job we got. That you're responsible for the animals, now name them. Okay, now take care of the garden. We were given a management job in the first chapter of Genesis in a way that no other creature ever does. Okay, so those are three ways. This is a sort of historic way of looking at that that goes all the way back to Augustine and Thomas Aquinas. Yes. In in the relational part, mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, maybe that's why there's so many admonitions in the scripture about guarding what you say, because language would be the major attribute or the major ingredient of that. I think. Right. And there's admonition after admonition to put you know guard over your mouth and the evils and of the tongue, and curse and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Because, and, and and we've always treated that so that we don't hurt somebody. Yeah. But this points out that it 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 is a it is a unique similarity with our God to be able to communicate with Right. And when we talk about the doctrine of God, we talked about the characteristic, well, actually the word of God earlier, and then we got into the doctrine of God too. That the fact that God speaks, that God reveals himself, but the fact that God speaks, is it's more than just uh, something God does. It actually is perceived, the fact that God speaks words, that he relates in language to us, um, that that is actually an attribute of God, in the same way that his, uh, his omnipresence, omniscience, you know, uh, etc., would be, because he does communicate. And I think that as we are made relationally, 
in the image of God, then it's true that the way we use our words, you know, we have language like no other being does. And the idols don't. And the idols don't. They, they sit there dumb. and they are silent. Yep. Okay. I'm at just a yes. Um, what about the ability to love? Well, that's that's in there. I mean, you know, the ability to love, love um, being um, like God. I'm going to talk about. In fact, in just a second, I'm going to talk about the aspects of humanity, the parts of being a person. And, there, um, and the reason this comes into it is because people would say, Carolyn and I would say, we think our God loves us. Of course, we do feed him. <laughs> but um, to what extent do other animals, certainly they can develop affection. You know, um, how does that relate to love? Now, it is true. As God is love, we are made in His image, we have the ability to love it at a, a scale completely different. But that will lead us into our understanding of what are we made of, either two-part or three-part uh, belief, and how does that differ from animals. And affection, and maybe love, come into that. I mean, almost anybody who's ever had an animal they were really attached to would say, yes, that animal loves me. Well, okay, we'll talk about that. But it's, you're right, God is love, and we are given the ability to love in a way, and that really fits under the relational thing, the, the, the ability to establish and maintain confidence in your relationships. The ultimate aspect of that is to love, and to have that love expressed. Okay? Now, I want to give you another approach to this. I want to look at three other ways, and this is, it's not that these are, it's either or, this is just a different way of cutting through it. This is a different way of thinking about it um, that is, is less... Historic. Again, the, the images, the, the thing I just gave you um, is very old. It's almost as old as Christianity itself. Uh, Augustine is the one that first really formulated that, and that goes back to the 400s. So, but this is a little bit more modern, but I think we can relate to it. The first way in which we're made in the image of God is that we have personality. That means we have individuality. This, 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 these things overlap. Again, this is just a different way of slicing the same stuff. We have individuality, we have knowledge, we have feelings, including religious feelings, and a will. A personality, I am a person, in the way that God is three persons in one entity. And in a way that we, do, we would not attribute that kind of personhood to a dog, no matter how smart they are, how much we love them. You know, a dog does not have religious feelings, for instance. A dog's will goes so far as, where's the treats? Okay. Um, and trust me, nobody loves dogs more than I do. Um, I sometimes feel bad because I'll be driving down the street and I'll see somebody with a dog and I don't even see the person. I'm looking at the dog. Okay? <laughs> um, so personality, that we are persons, discrete persons. Secondly, morality. We have an understanding of right and wrong and an ability to make moral decisions in a way that other animals don't. As much as we, you know, we come home and the dog has done something he shouldn't, and you know, he sees us and his ears go back and he feels really bad about it. And you say, well, he knows he did something wrong. Actually, he doesn't. He, what he knows is he did something that may get him punished. That, that's not the same thing. Okay, like we have a punisher dog. Um, but morality is the ability to determine right, that there is a right and there is a wrong apart from any sense of consequence. Some things are right, some things are wrong. It doesn't matter whether you're going to be punished for them or not. Only human beings have that capability and God, because that's one of the ways in which we were made in the image of God. You will remember that um, what was it that Adam and Eve were promised by the devil if they ate from the tree? The knowledge of good and evil. Now why anybody would want to gain the knowledge of evil when they didn't have to is always been a mystery to me. But that, you know, they knew goodness, they did not know evil, and yet they made a choice that was a wrong choice that took them to that knowledge. But human beings as spiritual beings made in the image of God. Only God and we have the ability to know right from it. The angels also have that. The angels, you know, they decided, one third of them, to rebel against God. I've done my Billy Graham invitation for you, right? I heard, I heard a comedian once say that, that Brother Billy Graham said, When Satan fell, he took one third of the angels with him. You know what that means? We got him outnumbered, two to one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
the idea is the angels could make a choice too, and they did. And one third of them, according to Scripture, made the decision against relationship with God. You know, as um, as they said, as it says in Faust, better to better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. Well, wrong choice. Guys. <laughs> um, but the idea of being able to make decisions between right and wrong. That's God's capability. He has given us that ability, the angels as well, but no other creatures. And then thirdly, spirituality. Duh. The idea that um, we have a body like all created beings, but in addition to that, we also have a spirit that allows us to be aware of and to be in relationship with and commune with God. No other creature has that. No other being on the created earth has that. Now. That gets us into a very interesting um, area and that I, I suggested a second ago, and that is, what is the spirit in us? The, the more traditional view of humanity, what are we, how are we constructed, how are we built, is that we have three parts. Now, there, some people hold to a two-part structure, and I'm going to explain that difference. But the traditional view is that human beings are made up of a soul, a spirit, and a body. Now, um, the two-part combines soul and spirit, and the reason for that is because there are a number of places, especially in the Old Testament, where it, it interchanges the words for soul and spirit. In the Old Testament, the word for soul is nephesh, the word for spirit is ruach, and there are places in the Old Testament they seem to be interchangeable. But there are other places that clearly they're differentiated. For instance, in the New Testament, where the words for soul is psyche, for spirit is pneuma, that's why the Holy Spirit is pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit. The idea is, it, it talks about things like that the Word of God is able to, is to, to divide soul from spirit. And there are a number of other places they seem to speak about those two things. Uh, I used to hold to a two-part, because I believed the soul and spirit was the same, but then I started thinking about it. I started thinking about my dog. And how is it that my dog seems to have a personality? It used to be dogs, it was a year ago we lost one. That they seem to have a personality, they seem to be able to relate to us, they seem to have joy when they see us, especially when we've been gone for a while. And yet I don't believe that my dog has a spirit in the sense that he can have a relationship with God. He can't accept Jesus, he can't expect, you know, C.S. Lewis says that our animals, that we, if we that they will spend an eternity in heaven with us simply because by loving them as we do, we have attributed to them a quality of existence that will guarantee them a life with us in eternity. I like that idea. I can't argue it from scripture, but it sort of makes sense. Um, the, so what's the difference? The idea in the three-part construction is that the soul is the part of us that is a personality that we see in our animals. For instance, I'm using that as an example simply because it's an easy one to see. It's the part that brightens up when they see us, that seems to have joy, that can be playful, that can relate to us. The spirit is the part of us that is uniquely capable of, of relating to God. Now again, in the two-part system, you've only got two parts. One is, is the part, the body, that's going to die and will need to be resurrected, as we believe, and there is the, there is the spiritual part that, that um, relates to God. But in this, we actually have a way of understanding, and besides that, this also explains for us, all human beings have a soul. We are animals at core. We have a soul. We can relate to one another. We have a personality. We have some sense of individuality. But apart from having, having come back into relationship with God, we don't have a spirit in the same way. That's why the gift of the Holy Spirit is given upon acceptance of Jesus Christ. Because by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we are given at that point the capability to be in relationship with God in a way we didn't have before. That's why everyone who accepts Jesus Christ is given the gift of the Spirit, because the gift of the Holy Spirit replaces what we lost in the fall that gives us the ability to now relate to God again. Right? Now, people before they're saved, they still they have a soul, they have a personality, they have the ability to, to relate and everything else. There's that part of them, they basically are like my dog. But uh, at the point at which we accept Jesus Christ, we are saved in order for us to reap the benefit of that, which is to be reunited in relationship with God, the place we were meant to be all the time, that is why the Holy Spirit indwells us, so that the Spirit then gives us the ability to be in relationship, to perceive the truth of God. That's why if before somebody's saved, before they have the Spirit, the things of God are described as being foolishness to them. 
They are blinded. They are unable to perceive the truth of these things. Why? Because the Spirit does not give, is not present in them. They do not have the ability to have that spiritual communion. John? I have a question. Um, you, you said that the Holy Spirit comes in and He replaces the human spirit. That's what I understood. He provides a spirit and it doesn't replace it. The point is that when before we are back in relationship with God, in the three-part system, we lack that spirit. We don't have the, the, the spiritual component that's necessary for us to be in relationship with God until the Holy Spirit gives that to us. That's why it says, Jesus saves us, but the Holy Spirit applies the justification. Right? Scripture says that. This is this um, this explains that. This structure explains that. Well, help me and correct me if I would be wrong in thinking that what you have is a lost person. He does have a spirit, but it is dead. It is spirit. absolutely dead. Yeah. That's called the spirit of death. That's what Paul called it. Death okay. went from all generation. But when that man is born again, there is something reborn. Right. And and. Am I correct in thinking that the that this the Holy Spirit comes in when you're born again and rebirths the human spirit that makes it pliable and cooperative with the Holy Spirit who has come to take resident in you, right. thus influencing your soul, your body? And, and that may very well be. I mean, but the the, the, the sense in which. Um, and again, it explains what is the difference. The component that is different for those people who are saved is the middle one. Exactly. The spirit in the sense in which that is a lot living thing exactly. that gives us the ability to relate to God. Okay. Now again, there are some people who look at that and, and you can see that argument. They think in terms of only two aspects. There is the, the body, everybody agrees on that one. And then there's the spiritual aspect, which is either dead or alive. Okay. Um, this makes sense to me in the sense of understanding what it means that the Holy Spirit applies justification to us. The Holy Spirit doesn't just sanctify, which means makes us holy, but one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to, to apply the saving justification that Jesus made available to us in our lives. How does He do it? He indwells us, whether it's then that spirit that communes with God or whether He enlivens the spirit that is dead within us. You know, I don't know. But, but you get the idea. The, the, Again, we're talking about the ways in which we are made in the image of God as, a, as opposed to other aspects of creation. All right? Any questions about that? Well, in other aspects of creation, there was a, a thing I got on the internet from a couple of churches, and it said, dogs have a soul. <laughs> and the other church said, dogs do not have a soul. And <laughs> so they were arguing back and forth. But in terms of, you can't receive the spirit without a soul, in my opinion. So a dog shouldn't have a soul. You may have a personality, but the personality doesn't mean it's a soul. Right? Well, that, see, that's, it's a, you're, coming, you're getting down on an issue of definition then. You know, what do you define as the soul? And the definition differs between people who believe there's a two-part construction in humanity and, and some people who believe there's a third. See, that, that argument, if there were two churches arguing about this, they probably had a different definition. Yeah. The people that said a dog does have a soul would define soul in this way, that the nefesh, or the psyche, is, is the personality that you can interact with, and we do interact with the personality of dogs. You know, yeah. Carolyn has always said she'd never had pets until we got married. And when we got two dogs right away, she said several times, I never had any idea, because she'd never had a pet, never had any idea that animals really have personalities, and they're different from one another, and they respond differently to things, right? Yeah. Well, again, Depending on your definition, you could say that that personality aspect of them that makes them different than a tree is a soul. But it does not give them the ability to have a spiritual relationship with God. That aspect is the spirit. So people who get that argument, basically you have got a two you know a two part structure versus a three part structure, and what are you defining? What how do you define your terms? But it seems to me that it is true for any of us who have ever had an animal that we got to know. That there is a personality there. There's something there that makes them different than a rock, you know, or a tree, or even a living or even plant, other dogs. Or, yeah. or even other dogs. Yes. Okay, but the sense, the sense is they've got something there that gives them the ability to be in relationship with you and with with other animals, but not spiritual communion. That's something different, right? But I like Lewis's idea that we will be with them in heaven. Do they have a spiritual connection with us? 
<laughs> no. I mean, if you look at, I mean, they, sometimes they look spiritual in the sense that you know they uh, they have this attitude where uh, they adore us. They adore us, yeah. And so, in, in other words, like we adore God, it's sort of an interesting concept. Well, and, and, and the idea there would be, I mean, that's an argument, not that they have spirit, but that they have soul, because we're, we're, our definitions, we're differentiating between those two, okay? Um, what do I next? I want to talk now about the creation of nature. It's important for us to recognize that while humanity is the highest point of creation, the pinnacle of creation, and Scripture says that, and we see humanity, I mean, let's face it, some people aren't that great, but still, <laughs> there is still something present in humans that differentiate them not just you know not just quantitatively but qualitatively from all other created beings. You know, we're there's a reason we're at the top of the food chain. It's not because you know we are the weakest of all animals. Our teeth aren't very big. We don't have any fur. We don't have any claws. You know, our arms are not very strong. We can't run very fast. How did we get? at the top of the food chain? Well, it's because we are qualitatively different than other animals. So that's why it's important to study humanity as the pinnacle of God's creation, if you're talking about creation. But that's not the only place we can learn something about the nature of God and His creation, because God did create everything else, and the whole of His creation gives us some understanding of the nature of God, of the way He works, what He has done, and why He has done it in creation. Okay. So I want to give you, I want to talk for a few minutes about four views on the source of the universe, or how did everything come to be, right? Um, that's not like it's a big topic or anything. How did everything come into existence? There really are only, historically speaking, there are only four major views for how the universe came into existence. And I want to address the four of those right now, and then whittle them down a little bit. First, the belief that the universe had no origin. It simply has always been, matter has always existed. You know, that infinitely dense speck of matter was always there. This is the dominant belief of most of the Western world today. This is the belief behind all scientific secularism. It is the belief behind secular uh, evolutionary theory. The idea that everything just is, and it's always been. <clears throat> There's no explanation for it. It didn't come from anywhere. It's just here. That's one. Second is the idea that everything came from a personal something, a being, and that being was good. This would be the category under which Christianity falls. I say Christianity, um, it, it, not all religions would be here. Some, quite a few of the religions, Eastern religions especially, believe that the world was created by an evil spiritual entity because they believe the physical world, all material things, are evil, are inherently bad. Spirit is good, physical is bad. And so they would say that the universe was created by a creature who is a being who is not good, if they believe in a being at all. all right? So, that's two. Everything came from a personal being, a personal something, and that being was good. Third, Everything came from a personal being, and that being was bad. Just refer to that. Some of the Eastern religions, etc. Um, and fourth, there is and always has been a dualism. A dualism between good and evil. Here you get into Zoroastrianism, you know, uh, and, and again, this is the other dominant belief in our culture today. Uh, number one is the dominant belief of people who see themselves as secular and scientific. Number four, is the belief of people who think, who think of themselves as being spiritual but not religious. It's a new agey kind of idea. That yes, there are good and evil, there are forces out there, but it's all equal. They're equal. They're equal. That's, that's equal. Dualism is the idea of equality. And sometimes it's, it's, it's confusing because Zoroastrianism, the ancient Persian religion, technically is considered a monotheism that Ahura Mazda was the one great God. But, throughout the history of the universe, Ahura Mazda has been opposed by an evil being named Ahriman, and throughout you know, all time and eternity as we know it, Ahriman has been fighting against Ahura Mazda, and it's back and forth. Well, 
And they call Zoroastrianism a monotheism, but to my mind, if there's a be an evil being that has been fighting tooth and nail equally against the, the Ahura Mazda, the one good God, that's a dualism. I don't care what you call it. If good and evil are fighting back and forth and neither side can win, then one of them is not the preeminent God. Okay, so those are the four ways in which people understand the universe having come in, into being. And whatever religion you want to take, whatever philosophy you want to take, including secular humanism, it falls into one of these. All right? Now, if I can turn the page, we'll keep going. Um, the first thing I would say is, um, again, asking the question, where did the universe come from? We then have to say, how did it get to be like it is? And I want to whittle these down. The first one, I would say, is that number three, everything came from a personal something which was bad. Philosophically speaking, it's possible, but nobody really holds that as being true. I mean, there, there are the religions, the Eastern religions, more ancient religions than modern Eastern religions, that hold that the material world is even was created by sort of a demigod who was, you know, who's gone off the rails and did a bad thing by creating the world. That's mostly an ancient belief. Um, those who today might hold it as part of the Eastern religion don't really lift it up because you can't go anywhere with it. So for all practical purposes, nobody really believes that anymore. That the world is the product of a bad being, even though it, hidden in the, you know, down deep in the doctrine of some Eastern religions that may be there, that the world is an emanation from an evil deity, those that are polytheistic religions, nobody really holds that up anymore because it doesn't take you anywhere. So, um, then the issue there is and always has been a dualism. That good and evil have e always been there and they've always been fighting and we see the, the awful results of that fight. There, there's a, a serious philosophical problem with even maintaining that as an idea for several reasons. One, if you say good and evil are fighting, dualism then there is inherent in that the idea that one is good and the other is evil. Well, where do you get the idea of good and evil? If there's two equal forces that are fighting, how can you say one is good and one is evil? C.S. Lewis makes the argument very clearly in mere Christianity that by the very fact that we identify good and evil as separate forces, there is some other power or idea or system or force that convinces us there is such a thing as good and evil. Because if the highest of all beings, with these two beings that are fighting, there's no good and evil is meaningless. You see what I mean? Where does the idea that one of them is good and the other one evil come from if they're equal? And if you say, well, it's just, it's based on the results, well, then the whole concept of dualism begins to fall apart then. It's simply dualism from a philosophical point of view is not reasonable. It is not rational. You play it out, it doesn't work. In fact, it inevitably points to the fact there must be some order of perception or understanding of morality that's higher than the forces of good and evil, or you wouldn't even be able to have those as definitions. Okay? So dualism does not work as a concept. And again, some of these things, which you've heard about, uh, and, and people who claim dualism now, well, there's good and there's evil, they've never thought about what it means. Because anybody who has pursued this in any sort of philosophical, reasoning kind of way comes to the point of saying that just simply doesn't work, it all falls apart. And Lewis does a great job of presenting that. Um, well, and I'll quote you here from Mere Christianity. Lewis says, since the two powers, good and evil, are judged by some outside standard as being good and evil, then this standard, or the being that made up that standard, is further back and higher up than either of them, and therefore he must be the real God. That's logic. Okay. He did a better job of explaining it than I did. That's why he sees Lewis and I'm not. <laughs> um, so dualism falls apart. That leaves us the two. The universe had no origin. It simply has always been. Matter has always existed. This, as I said before, is the dominant view of the secular world today. That the world just is. Don't expect to find an origin for it or an explanation for it. Now, does that mean that there is no good and evil in that? No. Oh. The idea of a dualism is that the ultimate powers are good and evil. I meant this one. Oh, yeah. Well, ultimately it would, yes. 
that, that, that this idea, which is a, the secular scientific view, and I don't have anything against science. I love science in its place. We really are talking about scientism here. Anytime you add a tism on the end of it, or you know, ism on the end of it, then that means the extreme. Islamism is the extreme militant form of the religion Islam. So, so in, this, in this form, what she said was it, that this... This bears no good or evil. Exactly. In fact, that's the point. Mm. Uh, one of the major points that the reason we have a problem with this is because there, when we talk about matter, matter has order. Well, if it's all just random, where did the order come from? If it's according to this system, there is no basis for morality. So how can one thing be good and another bad? It's just whatever works. Now. If you think about it, the fact this is the dominant uh, philosophy, whatever works, that is a major philosophical view of much of the world today. You know, if it feels good, do it. Doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe it in your whole heart. Basically, that means if it works for you, then it's fine. There are no standards. There are no, there's no good and evil. There's no morality. There's no explanation for the order that exists. The other option is that everything came from a personal something which was good. Now, um, let me talk about these in a little more detail. Um, if the first one is true, if the universe had no origin, it simply has always been, if matter has always existed, then how did personality, which exists in us, again, we're not just talking about that I'm, you know, I'm not like a tree, I'm not like a dog. There's something... Uh, different, qualitatively different about human beings. If everything just happened, where did personality come from? <coughs> how does it exist in us? And if it didn't exist in us, how could we be asking these questions? Mm -hmm. This is sort of a version of Descartes. I think, therefore, I am. I ask these questions, so therefore, I must have a personality. Where did that come from? There is no explanation. You could say, even if you argue that complex biological structures, you know, started with a pool of amino acids that turned into protein, that turned into single cell animals, that, which is way out there in terms of logic. Um, evolution is, is be, it's beginning to fall apart all over the place in terms of people's perceptions of it. Even, even non-believers, even secular people are beginning to say, you know, evolution by natural selection does not work. It simply is not rational. And Gruden does a good job of presenting that. But the idea, even if I believe that's true, then where did my personality come from? Where did the aspect of me that is able to ask these questions of meaning come from? There is no explanation for that in a purely secular, materialistic kind of view. And then matter, as we know it, as I suggested a minute ago, is unquestionably organized and appears to have a purpose. Matter is not random. If you guys have ever taken a biology class and studied all of the different, you know, Genus and phylae and all of the different structure of all of that stuff. How did all of that happen? Okay. Um, where did the organization and the purpose come from? Because creatures have purpose. They seek meaning if they're a higher level creature like us, or they, they, they seek reproduction if they're a lower level creature. Where did all of that come from? And if there is organization and there is purpose, does that not demand an organizer and a purposer? This is one of the arguments for the existence of God, the teleological argument, which is the, the argument of, from the watchmaker. Um, and again, in Grudem's book, I think it was in Grudem's book, I read a bunch of stuff, um, he said, if somebody found a digital watch lying outside an, an iron mine, and they took that digital watch and they gave it to a friend and say, I discovered this outside that iron mine. Apparently, all the materials in there coalesced in a random way to create this, this watch. What would you say to somebody who told you that? <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> what is wrong with you? A digital watch just happened to occur outside an iron mine by all the various pieces coming together and creating a timepiece. No. Where's the reason in that? That's the teleological argument, or the ar argument from the watchmaker. And again, um, there are good examples, statistical examples in Grudem's book, and a lot of other things have been done on that. But the basic argument is, the world does have order. The world does have purpose. Where does the order, where does the purpose, where does the personality come from? There is no explanation for any of those things in a purely materialistic view of the origin of the universe. It's simply, you know, the center does not hold. 
Carolyn? Do the purely materialistic people, do they just believe that we're all deluded? And thinking that there's good and oh, yes. and there's purpose yeah. and organization? They, they think we're stupid. And deluded, really. Yeah, yeah we fooled ourselves, yes. Okay. Um, they say they say that you're completely irrational to so, believe that. So that they don't really thing. see the organization. No, they think and, and they would say, "Well, this happened by chance. Just, we've made it all up." Yeah, and you've made it all up. You just created. This is just a perception. You deluded yourselves into believing this is true. Well, more and more secular scientists are starting to say, "No, we're not deluding ourselves and seeing some order." It doesn't mean they have to be a believer. They don't have to be spiritual, but they start looking at things and, and saying, "Well, if you and." and Grudem, again, does a good job with this. He quotes secular scientists who are writing books saying it's irrational to believe in, in evolution by natural selection as being the source of humanity. And they use, he gives you some statistics. These are mathematicians who've worked this out. That the odds of things occurring as they have is 10 to the 450th power. 450 followed by, you know, 450 million zeros. 10 followed by 450 million zeros. One chance in that many that it could have happened like this. He also quotes the, the well-known example, which apparently statistically is accurate. The idea that all of this, as we see it and understand it, could have come into existence <laughs> randomly is comparable to a tornado blowing through a junkyard, and when it blows through, it leaves behind a fully constructed and, and workable 747 jet. Yes. That's the same statistical likelihood. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Something. Question or comment? Yes. Well, I was just going to say that um, it's my opinion, or from what I've seen, that, 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 that the number one issue, or the universe had no origin, is simply a, has been a matter has always existed. Uh, it was, well, you sort of, Gary sort of answered the question. It's falling apart in many respects, and a lot of people are turning to the organization. In other words, there are scientists who look at the universe. Right. And they're saying there's got to be something more than just matter created. So I think the two together could lead to, as a Christian, I mean, you, you know, you look at Genesis, and you, you have a different understanding through faith, the Holy Spirit, etc. But right. I think number one could lead to number two very easily. In some respects, well, so they're not closed-minded. Okay. Exactly. If you're open-minded, I mean, if you yeah. if you if you follow down this route, yeah. and you're honest about the answers you find to your questions, I believe it will lead you to faith. A lot of people have done that. I mean, a lot of people have started out skeptical about <coughs> about things and sought scientific explanations for them, and came to the point where they said, "This doesn't hold. This well, doesn't the, work." The guy who mapped the human genome. Yeah, the head of the Human Genome Project, which is considered the greatest scientific achievement in human history is a believer. And he's a believer because when he started looking at the complexity of the human genome, again, far more complex than any other computer programming we've ever thought about, he said this couldn't be a chance. And he came to belief because of that. So I think the issue is, and I'll call on you guys in a second, the issue is, is it really reasonable to believe this? And more and more people, not just people of faith, but people of reason are saying no. This simply doesn't make sense anymore. Darwin is, you know, and, and I'm not picking on Darwin. Dar like so many people, Darwin had good observations, and he asked the right questions, but he came up with the wrong answers. That was true with Freud. Right questions, wrong answers. That was true with Karl Marx. Right observations, right questions, wrong answers. And those three people, Darwin, Freud, and Marx have been responsible for so much of the destruction of human society and of morality and everything else, and they meant well. Mm -hmm. Mike? There was, you know, my background is in human genetics, my undergraduate degree is in zoology, and we were taught Darwinism as, a, as dogma. Mm -hmm. It was just absolutely, totally dogma. Yep. But the interesting thing about this is part of the theory of Darwinism is that there's a slow evolution over time right. that steadily marches on as each individual favorable trait is selected for and arrives in the, in the, in the in, in created being. Well, what happens is very, it's very interesting because if you backtrack to the uh, to a shale in Canada that dates back to 530 million years ago, in a 10 million year space, which uh, is beyond Darwinism, 
they've got all 34 phyla of all all life right. created at that time and it explodes on the scene. Yeah, the, and, and the Cambrian explosion. It yeah. cannot it cannot be explained from from uh, a, a st slow steady Darwinian point of view. It just doesn't doesn't well, work. Well, and Grudem addresses right. that. that. So many biologists are now saying this idea of a slow evolution over time. That's not the, the historical record. That is the the uh, fossil record does not support that. In fact, a lot of scientists, uh, again, secular scientists, will advocate what's called punctuated equilibrium, which means everything goes along just fine, and then all of a sudden, like the Cambrian explosion, mm -hmm. thousands of new species arrive, like overnight. Boom. And then they go along for another 100 million years, and nothing happens, and then boom. Well, they can't explain how that happens either. You know, how did that all work? Well, Grudem does a good job of raising some of those issues, um, but ultimately it all boils down to the fact that it really is far more an act of faith to believe in evolution. And, and some, of the, some of the obvious pieces of it, Darwinian evolution by natural selection requires that each step in the evolutionary process has an inherent advantage which allows it to be maintained while others fall off. The problem, and I think Grudem mentions this, is some of the most complex of biological structures, like the human eye. And he talks about the bombardier beetle, right? Yes. You read yes. that? There, were, there are no intermediate steps that are advantageous that would allow them to have been retained and then go on to the next step of evolution. The human eye, the, the rigid secular evolutionists would say, began as a light-sensitive freckle. How do you get from a light sensitive freckle? What are the stages of substantive, the substantive advancement that would allow the next stage of evolutionary development to have been retained, and then the next step to have been retained, and the next step to be retained until you get to the human eye? It doesn't work. The bombardier beetle, for those of you who, yes. who I'm sure have yet to read your book, but you will, <laughs> there is this beetle that creates in its body chemicals, that it mixes those chemicals in a chamber and then ejects it as a defensive mechanism out nozzles in its back end that it can aim and it comes out of the, at, at these, uh, these uh, abrasive chemicals at 212 degrees. It comes out at boiling. Whoa. Now that happens in the, in the side of the beetle. The problem is the two chemicals that get mixed in the mixing chamber in this beetle and then ejected at 212 degrees Fahrenheit are so unstable that if you try to put them together in the laboratory, they blow up. So what were the stages of substantive <laughs> advantage at each way along the way so that the bombardier beetle didn't blow himself up before he could develop the ability to do that? It doesn't work. Now, I am not against rationality. I'm not against science. I'm just for being honest about this stuff. It does not work. This doesn't work. The newest theory I've heard, okay. <laughs> it's maybe not new, is uh, the multiverse theory, that there are infinite number of universes and we just happen to be in the one that everything came together like this. Okay, yeah. The, 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 the. So, so the 747 thing with the tornado, there, if, it's, if it's an infinite number of possible universes, it could happen. Well, that's that's. But still, even in, the, even in the multiverse, you still have the the, the odds are still there. Pretty that in true. that in any given in the one that it did occur, yeah. the odds are still what they are. You know, yeah. And I'm you know the, the verse is with you. <laughs> it's five minutes after. We're going to take a ten minute break, and then I think we made the point here that the first three and you can you can. Grudem gets into some of these things. The idea of a universe created by a bad personal being, nobody really holds that anymore, and the philosophy falls apart. Dualism doesn't work, because as Lewis so, so soundly argues, the very uh, existence of a good and evil dualism implies that there is some force above, above that that identifies good and evil. Um, the idea of a universe that has no origin, there are just serious logical complications from that. Grudem does a very good job of that, by the way. And there are a lot of other people I could recommend to you. I taught a class on 
Modern Evidence is for God, where we looked at a lot of this stuff. Michael Behe is one guy who's written a number of books. He is he's a a um, a physical biologist, I think. And one of the things he does that's fascinating, he looks at the flagellum, which is a you know a, a is it single cell. I mean, it's a tiny you know microscopic <coughs> creature. And the thing that shocked him, and one of the things that that again brought him to faith is as he analyzed that study is that the motor on a flagellum, a flagellum is a, is a, a flagellum is the, is the thing that sticks out. Well, of yeah, but uh, <coughs> what, what's the creature called? You're right. The flagellum is the thing. Anyway, he's got a, a, a little tentacle that sticks out that he moves. The creature moves, and that's how he propels himself through liquids. Well, the weird thing is, Michael Behe, when he started studying this stuff up close, realized. The aspects of the flagellum on this little protozoan creature are exactly the same as a motor that we make. All of the components of a technical motor, if we were going to try to build the same thing out of a motor, all of the pieces, you know, are there. Well, the microscopic. Uh, microscopic. <laughs> and he said, Man, really? <laughs> By chance? You know? My Mazda, I mean, I just got back from the dealer, so it is kind of terrible. <laughs> but the idea that that engine, in effect, which is comparable to the motor, the flagellum motor in microscopic creatures, that it just happened by chance, and all of the pieces that are necessary to make that work, I'm sorry, but it just, it strains all credibility. And, and as Carolyn said at the break, you know, the whole idea about, well, it's a multiverse, and so because there are multiple dimensions, multiple universes, and all that, and you have to go that far to try to make it make sense. Okay. How much is necessary for that? Um, I do recommend that if you haven't read the stuff by Grudem, he does a pretty good job of it. Yes? I just want to say, it just reinforces uh, Thomas Aquinas. And, and, I mean, this guy writes, I mean, I don't remember the date, but he talks about the original, the original um, movement. What was it? The, the prime mover. The prime mover. It's one of the arguments and, and, for God. Yeah, and that's his whole basis for his summa theological or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah, well, he actually had several arguments for the existence of God. The, the argument of the prime mover says, our experience tells us that for every effect, there is a cause. You know, every motion that we see, there is some mover, something that causes it to move. Well, and there's something that causes that to move. And there's something that causes that to move. And if you push that back far enough, what was the first mover? What was the first or prime mover? What started the process? Um, there's, you know, that's one of the arguments he makes for God. Yeah, uh, just reinforces that. So, that leaves us with one idea, and that is the only reasonable view of the source of the universe is left to be that everything came from a personal being, and that that's something, that personal being is a being who is good. This is the, this is the, broad description of what our Christian faith is all about. Okay. We started with four. We've chopped them away. We are left with this one. And the real basis of this, I mentioned earlier, I quoted the verse already, goes back to in the beginning. Our doctrine of creation starts with Genesis 1.1, in the beginning. And the several things that are part of that, and I kind of alluded to them earlier, is first, that God, the personal being who is good, that God was there at the start when nothing else existed. That's the first principle in our doctrine of creation. Nothing else except God was there in the beginning. Secondly, that creation occurred as an orderly unfolding of the mind and purposes of God. Nothing else. There was no other reason except that God wanted to do it. It gave him pleasure. In the same way that when we create, if you paint or you sculpt or you sing or you decorate houses, if that is your creative expression, you find joy in that. And there may be no other reason for it. That was the nature of creation, that God did it as an orderly unfolding of his mind and purpose, and he then, and this is important, immediately upon the act of creation, God declared a moral pronouncement over it. And God saw that it was good. Each of the steps along the way, and God saw what he had done, and it was good. And at the end it says, and God looked at creation, and it was very good. So God took joy in making this good thing. 
And we have to say that if God pronounced his creation to be good, then we have to find it good as well. And again, there are some religions and some individuals that see creation as nothing more than a, um, a struggle, a negative thing. You know, that, that the world is, is a place that was created by and maintains itself through crisis. You know, that human life is a process of crisis management and nothing more because the world is a... Is a now, we have to recognize that the world has fallen. There is sin. There is failing in the world. There is pain in the world. But at its core, creation is still good. If we take the step of saying that all creation is evil, is bad, then we come back and start questioning the very nature of God's creation, God as the creator, and the fact that he pronounced it to be good. <coughs> Something can be good and still be broken in places. Right? Um, God said it was good. We accept it as being good as well. Now, um, we need to have a response to that. How do we deal with this belief about creation? And how do we deal with the fact that God made it, He made it for His pleasure, He made it good? I want to give you several responses that we uh, necessarily have to have to the nature of God's creation if, if this is what we believe. And this is the Orthodox Christian view of creation. First, we have to be thankful for the world that God has made, for all of the struggles that are in it. Gratitude should be our response. Praise to God for being the creator should be our response. Human nature is such that we want to focus on the parts that are broken instead of recognizing the glory that is. And we've all had the experience of looking up at the stars or at the full moon, last night was almost full, or the beauty of the mountains, uh, you know, and, and going, wow. Well, does the awe that we feel, does that lead us, it should as Christians, does that lead us to be thankful and say, thank you, God. You are a glorious creator. Nobody else could do this. It should. That should be our first response, is gratitude and praise. Secondly, we should delight in creation, which means we should appreciate it and enjoy it when we see it. It's not just, that's cool, but wow doesn't get any better than this should be our response to creation to delight in it because God made it for his glory but he also made it for our enjoyment and scripture is clear about that he made it beautiful for us did you ever wonder why food tastes good why it's not just fuel I mean the reason we eat is because it's fuel we have to have something to run our bodies on but I know chocolate covered strawberries <laughs> Or whatever it is that makes you, <clears throat> why did God make it taste good? Why did he give spices? You know, why did he give the range of color that exists in the world? Why isn't that a black and white world? God gave that to us for our enjoyment, for our delight. That's the way the world is the way it is. For all of the fact that it's, it has a fallen aspect too. Third, we need to demonstrate responsibility toward creation and nature. Caring for it and using it in the proper way. There are some Christians who believe that when God said that we are supposed to subdue the earth, that means, you know, make it pay. <laughs> you know, crush it. Make it do what you want, not what's good for it. That's not what he meant, folks. I believe a lot of Christians are going to have to, you know, answer for how we treat creation. God gave us the gift of this world, and we treat it like it was started out as a trash dump, and we're trying to finish filling it up. We have an obligation. When God gave us the responsibility to care for the garden, and then that garden got expanded to, to all of the places where humans are, when he told us to take care of the garden, he didn't mean crap it up until it's unlivable. We have a responsibility to take care of creation. Now, that doesn't mean we confuse creation with the creator. We don't worship creation. We worship the creator. But we have a responsibility to care for the creation in obedience to the creator. Some people say, well, when you start talking about, you know, all of this, this tree-hugging stuff, then you're, you're actually being a pagan. You can't be Christian and be, be an ecologist. You know what? If you're not an ecologist of some kind, then you're probably not Christian because you don't take seriously what the creation is. Because, and let me give you this doctrine. I, 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 think, it, I think I've talked about this before. This is from our old pastor, Earl Palmer, who's a brilliant guy. 
he, is, he has said, and I completely agree with him, that there are two fundamental principles to our faith. There are two pillars on which everything else is built. Everything hangs. And the analogy he uses, it's like the Brooklyn Bridge. When the Brooklyn Bridge was built, it, it covered, it, it, nothing else had ever been done like it. It was the most amazing architectural feat, engineering feat in the world, because there were two pillars, these, these columns, that literally go down to the, to the bedrock. A lot of people died because they didn't have the technology to effectively be able to go that deep in order to sink those things into the stone at the bottom of the East River. So these two giant columns and then the giant cables off of that, and everything hangs on the solidity of those two pillars. That's how a suspension bridge works. I just crossed the Golden Gate Bridge, which is another suspension bridge, even though I wasn't supposed to be going to Sausalito at the time. <laughs> uh, but those two pillars in our faith are creation and redemption. Creation, because God made us and has a claim to us. Redemption, because God then saved us from ourselves and our own sin. Everything else, every other doctrine, every other aspect of belief we have, hang off of the two great truths, the two great doctrines of creation and and redemption. And Earl even tells a story about that. Forgive me if I've already told this story. Some of you have heard it. There's a little boy who lived in New York City. And this little boy really liked sailboats. And so he didn't have the opportunity to fix a sailboat, but he made a small sailboat with his own hands. And he really worked at it and everything else. And when he had it all done, he takes it out and he puts it in the pond in Central Park. And it's got sails, and the wind catches the sail and starts blowing it off. And when it gets out about 50 yards or so, he realizes he had not developed, he had not put together any way to get it back. So it sailed off into the distance, and he lost his boat. Well, a couple of weeks later, he's walking down the sidewalk past a pawn shop. He looks in the window, and there's, a, there's his boat. And he goes into the pawn broker, and he says, That's my boat. I made that. I lost it on the pond. It's in the park. And the guy says, Well, I'm sorry. I can't just give it to you. I, I believe you, but I paid somebody else for it. So the little boy goes home and he breaks open his piggy bank and, piggy bank and he scrapes together all the money he can and he goes back to the pawnbroker and he pays the pawnbroker for his boat. And as he's walking out of the shop, he looks at the little boat and he says, and now, little boat, you are truly mine because I made you and then I paid a price for you. Creation, redemption, the two great pillars on which all of our faith is built. That's why the doctrine of creation is so important. You, t you find somebody who says, well, yeah, I, you know, I believe in God, but I don't think God made everything. They have a fundamental problem, because without the doctrine of creation, we have nothing that connects us to God as creator God. It is fundamentally important to us. Okay? We have a responsibility. I, I didn't mean to launch into that little sermon right there, but that happens. In addition, number four, we should allow the created world to lead us to trust God. Again, that doctrine of creation, the idea that God made everything that is. He made us, and therefore, we need to trust Him. If He could do all that, then He is, you know, he is a God that can be trusted. He is a God we need to look to. Okay. Any questions about any of that? There are a number of other critical aspects of the Christian doctrine of creation. These are, these are like uh, five points that I want to make as a, as a clear um, summary of what we believe about creation. First, creation is distinct, the creation, that is the, the, the material world, is distinct from God. There are some belief systems that believe that, that um, all, all the sum total of all of the physical world is God. That's called pantheism. You may have heard that word. Pantheism means that if you add everything up together, all of you people and the tables and the camera and the buildings and the trees and the lakes, if all of that together is God, that's pantheism. A second version of that is panentheism. Add an in in the middle. Panentheism says that all of these things are part of God, but God is bigger than that. An example of that would be the... Um, the Native American religions. You know, they have various spirits and things like that. The spirit of the wolf and the spirit of the mountain. But then they have the great spirit that's above the created world. That's a good example of panentheism, that all of these things plus some other spiritual aspect are God. 
That is not the Christian doctrine. Those things are antithetical to what we believe. We believe that God created, but that God and the creation are distinct from one another. The created world is not God and is not part of God. Clear? Does that make sense? So that's the first principle. Secondly, we believe that while creation is distinct from God, it was created by Him and it is still dependent on Him. That gets us into the issue of the providence of God, which we'll talk about in a minute. That means it is not materialism, it is not dualism, it is not deism. And I'll give you some definitions. Materialism is the idea that there's no God work at all. It's just, everything just is. You know, it always has been. It is the form it is. That's materialism. That the only thing is the material world. There is no spiritual. There is no spiritual God or spiritual anything else. It's all material stuff. Secondly, dualism we've talked about. The idea that there is this balance of good and evil that's fighting in the world. Well, no, you know, that's not what we understand. As we've talked about. And finally, deism. Deism is the belief that it has two forms, deism. Either that God is not a personal being, but is rather an evolutionary force. Voltaire believed that. Thomas Jefferson believed that. Uh, the idea that there is a non-personal motivator, and they usually will capitalize evolutionary forces, though that makes it better. Okay. Um, that some force has created a motion forward, but it's not a personal force. It's not somebody you can talk to or relate to or have a relationship with. Um, the other form of deism is that God created the world, and this is the, you know, deus ex machina, God in the machine. That God created the world, and then he went to Puerto Vallarta, and we can't get to him anymore. Okay? Or he went somewhere else. That God is an absent creator. He's no longer available to us. So either non-personal evolutionary force, or not available even if he was a personal creator. He went somewhere else now. Neither one of those is what we believe. Not materialism, not dualism, not deism. Those things are antithetical to our Christian faith because none of them allow for creation to be one of those two great pillars in our, in our belief system. Okay, questions about that? I see puzzled looks on a couple of faces, but um, Chris. I'm just curious, um, intelligent design, you know, they're like, I know Christians can use intelligent design because, you know, God's intelligent. Right. Uh, but you see non-Christians that are, are saying, well, there is intelligent design, but does that... Like, would that be similar to deism? Or? It's, it's possible that intelligent design could be an expression of deism, meaning there's an evolutionary force. There's some intelligence, but not a personal intelligence. Now, that's an oxymoron to me. You know, it's got intelligence, there has to be some personality behind it, or, or it's not intelligence. It's, it's just, you know, I don't know. Um, but yes, they could do that. If, they, if somebody, for instance, if somebody studies this and they decide they cannot accept um, the historic view of evolution as the way that world came about, and they choose that they're going to believe in intelligent design, which means that there was an intelligence behind it, but they're not willing to go the whole way and say, I believe in God, then they may have a deistic form of belief that some force actually did this on purpose. It's not an accident, but it's not a God we can relate to. Okay? Third point. And, and we've suggested a couple of these before, but I want to make, uh, make sure we get them clear. God did not, and he does not, need creation or creatures. The aseity of God, that's, that's one word, meaning that, that God, God has no needs. <coughs> he created and he sustains creation purely for his own glory and pleasure. And a lot of contemporary Christians make this mistake. A, a popular heresy is that God made us because he needed us to worship him. God does not need us to worship Him or do anything else. God does not need us full stop. He desires us. He does it, you know, He created the world and us for His pleasure because He found gratification or satisfaction in that in the same way that you might paint or sing or draw. But not because He needed to any more than you need to do those things. You know, people say, oh, I have to write music. If I don't, I'll just die. Well, probably not. <laughs> You'll be less comfortable. But, but God would not have been less comfortable. He did it purely because he desired to, and he took pleasure in it, not because he needed it. God does not need us, but you know what? In a very real way, that makes us even more special. Because God doesn't need us, and he chooses to love us and be in a relationship with us anyway. It's like the people who adopted you know, a child, and they had other natural children. And at some point, they say to the adopted child, you know, you will always be special to us, because 
Our, and our other children are special to us. We love them too, but in a different way because, you know, they're a product of our bodies, but we chose you. We picked you, and you will always have a special place to us because you are chosen. That's what God did to us. Not because he needed us or had to have us or gained anything from having us. He wants to be in a relationship with us, and he made us for that reason. And people who believe that God needed something, that he created the world because he needed it, or he created us because he needed us to worship him, that's simply not scriptural. The fourth point, God's created world, though fallen, is still good. And again, this is not Gnosticism, it's not asceticism. Gnosticism is, is the ancient, I mean, full-blown in the second century. Paul, I believe in the book of Colossians, is talking about an early Gnosticism or proto-Gnosticism. Gnosticism believes in that the, the secret to life is, is special knowledge, secret knowledge. That's what gnosis means in Greek. But part of the Gnostic belief was that um, the physical world is evil, that anything physical is bad. And so they would, they would advocate asceticism. Well, there are a lot of Eastern religions that advocate asceticism as well. Asceticism means denying the human body, and the primary reason for doing that is because you think the human body is evil. And if you give in to any of its motivations or hungers or drives, then you're giving in to evil. Christianity, the doctrine of creation, does not allow us to believe that the material world is evil. When God created it, he said, and it is good. And it's still good, even though spiritually it's broken. That's what the fall is all about. Human beings, while they may be broken, they may be fallen, they may do evil, we are made in the image of God. And there's an aspect of us that always will be in the image of God and always, therefore, will be good. The way in which we're in the image of God is good. Even if we do evil, even if we're fallen, even if we're sinful creatures. Because we believe God's created the world. Wait, wait, wait. I got a question. Excuse me, excuse me, Phil. You just said we're good, even though we're sinful creatures. Now, that no, no, we, well, the image of God in us is good. The fact that we're made in the image of God, that there is a part of us that is part of creation in a good way. Now, unless we accept Christ, unless we, you know, we turn to Him and accept reconciliation back to God, then that goodness is not sufficient to save us. But that's why people, even, even fallen people, even people that are not saved, can from time to time do good things. There is still some aspect of good in them because we are part of God's good creation. That doesn't mean spiritually we're okay. Fair? Okay. And then, ultimately, when all things are known, and uh, I think, is it Grudem that talks about this? He quotes Francis Schaeffer. Francis, Francis Schaeffer wrote a book called No Final Conflict. The, our belief is that, yes, there are ways in which scientific evidence and our faith, we don't know how those things fit together. There is nothing that's absolutely unequivocally, unequivocally contradictory to the evidence and the faith. And in fact, as Schaefer says, and as I maintain here, when all things are known, and let's face it, we don't know very much right now, when all things are known, there will be no final conflict between the created world as understood by faith and by science. That should be an as, not an is. In other words, right now, we don't know how all of the aspects of what we believe about creation fit together and, and uh, jive with all of the things that we, that we believe from science. We simply don't know that. Um, someday we will. And our belief, part of our faith, is that there will be no final conflict. When all things are known, then it will be clear to us how these things fit together. All right? Schaefer was one of my heroes early in my faith. C.S. Lewis and Francis Schaefer especially. So, Grudem goes into great length talking about the various theories uh, from, from secular evolution to um, young earth Creation, young earth creation would be the, the belief that God created the world 6,017 years ago, 4,004 was when the creation happened. Um, almost nobody, I shouldn't say that, quite a few people still believe that, but um, there's not any good real justification for, for doing that now because there are all sorts of problems with Bishop Usher, Archbishop Usher's process by, where he, by which he came up with the 4,004 being the, the, uh, the date of creation. He went through and very simply added up the ages of all of the people that we have in the Bible 
and figured out that from where he was to how, how much that added up, it went back to 4004 BC. Well, the problem is scripture, and, and Gruden talks about this, scripture is very clear that we have the same gene genealogies in places, and there are places where there are names in one and that names in the other, because when they did genealogy, they didn't feel any obligation to put everybody in there. They just wanted to list the ones that for some reason stood out, the ones that were important. We have no way of tracking the exact age of the world. You get into the gap theory that there was a, a huge amount of time between Genesis 1 and Genesis, Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. You get into the day age theory to God. A day is as a thousand years of the thousand years a day, and on and on. Grudem goes into all those details. But the conclusion is we do not know and cannot know for certain how old the earth is, how God did it, etc. Now, there may be people in this group. I know people who would, who would jump to their feet and declare me a heretic right now, because I say you can't know. And if you don't believe, some people would say, if you don't believe the world is 6,017 years old, then you can't be saved. You can't be a believer. All right? Really, I'm not exaggerating that. To demand more than admitting we don't know how old the world is or exactly how God did it and how creation and evolution, I'm sorry, but the billions of fossils out there there's no good explanation for that other than the world is older than 6,000 years. Marvin? When Adam was one day old, how old did he look? Yeah. Well, that was one of the things that Gruden gets into. And when the tree was one day old or two days old, did it have rings? Uh, when the animals were there, he made a, a mature man, he made mature animals, he made a true mature forest. Underneath the soil would be uh, humus to, 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 nur to nurture the trees. Right. If you do a, um, uh, um, what is it, um, anyway, he could make a mature earth as well. Yeah. With the fossils, with coal and oil and precious stones and all these things with a history. And, and with stars, yeah, you know, with the beams of light that are 2,000, look like yeah. they're millions of years old. Now, that's true. Yeah. That's called mature creationism. Yeah. The problem is, what was the purpose of the fossils? Because... Is God just trying to trick us? Is he trying to mislead us? Is he trying to confuse us by adding an aspect that, that, that tends to pull people away? And there's not a good answer to that. that that's true, but he, again, we he, he see that he does mature trees and animals and people. There's no reason to say that he cannot have made a mature earth. And today, with fracking, we're enjoying some of these things that we think have been there for a long time. You know, it gives a history to it. In the Wild West, when they go to do a movie and they put a village up, and they just have the fronts of the these buildings on the street, there's nothing behind it. Yeah. It's empty. So if, you know, you go into the ground, there's nothing there. It's it just all of a sudden. So I think it would be natural to do a mature earth, but that's well, my opinion. Well, the idea of mature earth creationism is one of the theories. And you know what? This is my belief, and when I get to heaven, if, he, if, if God says, well, mature earth was the right one, I go, well, that's interesting. I'm not going to have a problem with it at all. Or if he says, you know, uh, 4.5 billion years. Wow, that's a long time. If he says 6,017 years from now back, 4,004, I'm going to go, wow, you did a lot in a short period of time. <laughs> I'm not going to have a problem with any of those things. But the point is, right now, we don't know. And we've got people chewing each other's legs off because somebody disagrees with them about those issues. And we do not have sufficient support to do that. Now, let me finish this on going, John. As long as we have, my point here, as long as we have faith that God is the creator and the sustainer of the universe, then we're good. Even if we don't have more details of how or when he did it. I believe he made it. He sustains it. He is the creator and lord and master of the universe. The rest of it I'm not going to know until I stand in his presence. And, if, and for me to be angry and vindictive, malicious toward people who have one theory when I might have another one, is ungodly. John? This conversation reminds me of uh, God speaking to Job. And he says, were you there? Exactly. When I spread the Pallades over the heavens. Mm -hmm. you know, so we'll know one day. Or stretched out the horizon of the earth or yeah. whatever. No, we, we simply don't, don't know. And we need some humility. And that's why I say that to demand more than this is almost always simply pride talking. This is what I think, and you must be an idiot because you don't agree with me. Right? Really? 
I didn't yeah. say that because that's what I believe. I say, I said oh, yeah. because I, it came to me reading this book. I went, oh, there's a theory that I had never. Exactly. And it's a possibility. And, so, and, and you know, and from that point of view, if God, if the mature earth creationism, if God did create the earth with all of those mature characteristics, for instance, people would say, how can the earth only be 6,000 years old or even 60,000 or 600,000 years old when we have light from stars that are so far away that it took a million years to get here? Well, the mature earth creationists can say, well, when God created those stars, he created the beings of the light along with them. All right? Now, might be. Okay? I want to read you something that you read in, because I think he does, says it very well. In Wayne Grudem, he says this. Therefore, with respect to the length of days in Genesis 1, the possibility must be left open that God has chosen not to give us enough information to come to a clear decision on this question. And the real test of faithfulness to him must be the degree to which we can act charitably toward those who in good conscience and full belief in God's word hold to a different position on that matter. Amen. I think that's exactly right. That's well said. And Grudem is a good example of somebody who investigates all the possibilities. He says why this one, you know, this what, what credit we can give this one and what doesn't seem to make sense in that one, and on and on. So it's very much worth studying that. But this is where we need to end up. I don't know. And you know what? When I need to know, God will tell me. But right now, he has not given us sufficient information for anybody to be dogmatically aggressively insistent that their way is right. And this should not be a factor that affects our faith. Amen. I had a good friend, um, Richard Sears, who was a professor at Berea College. I was a student, we got, got to be friends when I was a student, he was a professor. Richard was a Christian, a very smart man. He's an English professor. He wasn't a theology professor or a science professor or whatever. He's an English professor. Well, in class one day, one of the students had, said, had found out that Richard was a Christian. He says, so what do you think about uh, creation and evolution? English class. <laughs> and Richard said, I really don't care. <laughs> and the student said, but you have to care. <laughs> and Richard said, no, I don't. Because I don't know, I can't know, and not knowing has no effect on my faith in Jesus, nor how I live out my Christian life. So I don't care. Someday we'll know. Right now we don't. I got no problem. And I'm right there. The thing I have to believe, and that I have to insist others believe, is that creation is not random, it's not a product of dualism, it's not a product of an evil being. We have to believe that God is the creator and sustainer of the universe, and that he is good, even though we don't have details of how or when he did it. That, if we needed more than that, then it would not be so hard to figure out, God would have told us. Are we good with that? Yes. yes. I think it's great to study the different things. Ruth does a good job of that. Okay? I am going to, this is why I told you I wasn't going to spend a lot of time on Providence today. <laughs> I am going to give you a definition of Providence, and then we will get into it in more detail later, especially when we deal with how Providence affects our understanding of our relationship to God and the world, etc. Providence is the way in which God continues to control and be involved in the universe he created. Okay, he created, that was the first part. Providence is, is the idea of the doctrine that he, he didn't, he's, it's not deism. He didn't create and then go away. God has continued to be here. He has continued to be involved. Nothing happens apart from his knowledge and his involvement. Now, the extent to which he is involved, people differ very strongly on that. Okay, very strongly. Um, the, the, they especially get, you know, get up on their high horses when you start talking about the way in which God's providence affects who gets saved and who doesn't. And that's why we're going to deal with that later. But there are a lot of people who have a whole lot of vested in this issue that may surprise you in, in their view. You all know who Johnny Erickson Tata is? Yes. Johnny broke her neck when she was 16 years old. She's quadriplegic. Um, when she was in her 20s, she learned to draw and paint with her mouth. With holding either, a, she used to use flare pen for drawings or brushes for painting, and she was really good at it. In fact, she became quite famous for it, and she's a, she is a very committed Christian believer. So she became very popular on the talk show circuit because of the skill she had. She's written a number of books. The most recent one is an interesting book. She, she married a 
little bit later in life, and her husband, um, Ken Tata, that's why it's Johnny Erickson Tata, just used to be Johnny Erickson. Um, Johnny was diagnosed with cancer a number of years ago, and so even though, and this is a little ironic, even though she does not have control of her body, she still feels pain, but she can't do anything about it. And so she's been suffering from the pain of the cancer at the same time that Ken, her husband, was suffering from almost debilitating depression. And so the two of them have written a book together now, dealing with their respective disabilities in that regard, and how they, God has led them through it, and, and used them to encourage each other in it, and all that. So Johnny's an extraordinary person. She's also, she's recorded a number of music, of albums. She's also a singer. Well, I worked with her for a while. And I know Johnny well. Johnny broke her neck at 16. She was a beautiful young girl, beautiful woman, and all these people would say, how can that be right? How can that be God's will that a beautiful young girl like you would break her neck and be in that chair for the rest of your life? Blah, blah, blah. Johnny says, God caused my neck to get broken. Her understanding of providence is such that she believes no act happens outside God's specific intent and will, even to the point that God was present and involved the day she dived into that pool, hit the rock at the bottom, and broke her neck. Being in that chair for the last 35 or years or so gives her a lot of credibility, to my mind. She's also an excellent theologian. The point is, the doctrine of providence, however far you go on that spectrum of how involved is God, how much. And see, when we rebel against that idea, when people say, oh, well, what are you basing that disagreement on? Johnny is an avid student of Scripture. She is reflecting a, re a traditional Reformed view of God's providence. Grudem gets into the difference between the Calvinist Reformed view and the Arminian view. He is a Calvinist, a Reformed Calvinist theologian. I am a Reformed Calvinist theologian. Okay? But the doctrine of providence, and this is the key part, even though you may disagree we're on that spectrum, but I would challenge you that if you do disagree, what are you basing that disagreement on? If you're disagreeing with what Johnny said, or with people who say that God is involved in every act, even the ones we don't understand because they look so harsh. The doctrine of providence insists that God has not abandoned the world he created, but continues to be active in it. The argument is, how active, in what way? And I don't have time to get into all that today. Any questions? And, I, and if you're one of the people who disagreed with, that, with what Johnny believes and what I just said, I want you to spend some time thinking about why you disagree. Is it just because something in you rebels, or do you have some scriptural authority for it, or where does that come from? You know, what is your thought on that? Ken? You know, the, the thing about that particular belief, if you truly believe that, then you really can cast all your cares upon the Lord. Yeah. And you can live each day, and you can look at every detail that ends your life and says, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for me at this moment, and I can embrace that regardless of what it is, and trust God that is going to, he is going to sustain and hold me through that situation. Right. No matter how difficult it is or how much I don't understand it. And there are a lot of scriptures, and I can find scriptures on the other side too. I want to be fair here. But let me give you a few real quick. Proverbs 16.1, the plans of the mind belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Proverbs 21.1, Proverbs is especially big on this thing. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it where he will. So part of the question here is, where is free will versus God's direction? That's, part of, that's the biggest question in providence is, what is free will and how does it fit into the fact that God is still here, he still is in control, he still is actively involved? Um, Proverbs 16.9, a man's mind may plan his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Proverbs 21.30, no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. And I could go on and on and on with scriptures that say, no matter, you know, that yes, we have free will, but God does not give us free will to do anything. Does he? Where is that balance? That's the question of providence and why it's such a big issue. I knew I wasn't going to have time to get into it big time today. Marvin. <laughs> Two examples. Jesus, three times in the garden, prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. And then he went through with it. Yep. Paul three times prayed that the thorn of the flesh would be, and then he went through with it. So whatever we believe, it's what are you going to do with what God 
right? Yes. Yes. And those are examples of the very fact of Christ on the cross is an yeah. example of the fact that God has not abandoned the world. It's not a free-for-all. God is still actively, providentially, that's where we get that word, involved in the events of the world. Okay? We may have to find another whole week to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. God bless you. I will see you next week.